I'm Kari Reagan. Welcome to tonight's Nats Chat. And I am your host, and I my co-moderator is the fabulous Peggy Baruti. And I am thrilled to be welcomed by Dr. Al Maradi and Michaela Martins. And as a brief introduction, uh, Dr. Al Maradi is the surgeon and chief of laryngology at the University of Washington. I have the privilege of working in affiliation with him uh, um, when we work with injured singers. So I am privileged to his sense of humor and also the personal care he gives our singers. Um, Michaela Martins uh, is um, a renowned opera singer. She sung at the Metropolitan Opera, at Vienna, at Munich. This season, she sung at San Francisco Opera and Houston Opera, and she has been a dear friend for a few decades. So I'm thrilled to have both of you here with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start with Al. What, what would you like to, as a broad topic, tell Nat's members about care of the professional voice? What do you want Nats teachers to know about how you work with us on a team and care for our singers? Well, thank you. It's uh, really cool to be part of this and I appreciate it. And uh, the relationship between Nats, the folks they represent, the people they teach, right? The tea part, um, you know, it's a really rich part of what we do in the professional voice community. As physicians, what message would I give? I would say that uh, this, the game has changed. The, 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 the capacity to get a sense and evaluate what's going on, the communication about what's going on, the interaction between the, the teachers of singing, the physicians, and that important third part uh, of, of what we do, the, um, our speech language pathologists, that conversation continues to get richer and deeper as we go on. It's, I, I, I feel people I feel that, that uh, maybe our colleagues in singing imagine that some of the major changes that have occurred in voice care have been technological. And while that is not untrue, uh, I don't think it's the heart of what's going on. I think what has really changed is the sense of collaboration and communication and this complete obsession that you know really competent voice care uh, folks, physicians, have in describing what's going on, you know, really looking at the vocal cords, talking about the vocal cords, and talking to teachers of singing and speech pathologists, and trying to put together a better answer than, than you know, oh, it, it's something you're doing wrong, right? Too much, too often, bad technique. I think that's what's changed. We want to be better about what we think is going on, communicating about it, and as the word we were talking about, you know, to decatastrophize, you know, when when folks you know have problems with their voice. Thank you. I love that description. And as you often tell us, the care has to come from a very specific type of doctor, a laryngologist, of which there are about 300 in the country. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's about right. In the U.S., there's somewhere between, yeah, two and 300 people who are fellowship trained in laryngology. Now, any ear, nose, and throat doctor you know, is trained in this area, and some of the best lary uh, laryngological care folks, professional voice care folks, um, don't have the fellowship training. Uh, and so I wouldn't say that having or not having fellowship training in laryngology, it makes you or doesn't make you a, a good voice care physician. Uh, but but otolaryngologists are, who are interested in show their competence and their, and their commitment to this area, that's where you should really start. And many, many of them, probably the majority of them nowadays, are, are, have this extra training in laryngology. And Mickey, from the from the perspective of the elite professional singer, what is a broad topic that you want our members to know about? Uh, I think uh, more or less, there's two things that, that, that uh, your doctors need to become part of your inner circle, part of your safe circle and your team. That that in in instances where professional singers. Um, have something happen on a job, it's a very, very hush-hush subject. There's a lot of shame attached to that. There's a lot of um, um, self-blame. There's a lot of, of asking yourself, what, you know, what did I do? I really, I really done something now. You know, that, that kind of thinking, which oftentimes when you're singing, it, 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 the lengths that we do and the volumes that we do, the, chances of, of minor injury or or even just suffering fatigue and singing too long, it happens all the time. So 
losing that the idea that it's that it's something that you should hide that that really we should include our doctors and and our voice care professionals as part of our safe circle those should be the first calls mm -hmm. not your fellow and, and even in fellow singers don't want to talk about it with each other mm -hmm. you know it, it's 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 a very i don't know and i'll never understand it it's a very um sort of shame based topic and yet it happens i don't know a professional singer that hasn't experienced something where you they needed a physician and isn't you it, it you know it's, oh, sorry you go ahead al it was it's interesting you know uh years ago uh, mike johns and i with adam klein and i think marina gilman i forget all everyone who's involved but we did a very interesting study of um, folks this was at a contemporary commercial music type conference um and about what were the barriers to seeking out healthcare in folks who are having trouble with their voice. And uh, it's not that we couldn't imagine what the main you know, outcomes were gonna be, but, but it was really a lot, confirmed a lot of our fears that it was access, it was information, it was insurance, and it was you know, the actual physical act of getting examined and the concern of what, what would be found and how it would be potentially misunderstood or how someone would become labeled. So we, I would say together, us, people on this webinar, people in my circles, you know, need to work on, you know, smoothing out some of those barriers and speed bumps because people don't easily get, get the care they need. And it's not, not always, you know, the, the physician doing everything right or wrong or maybe not listening well. I think there are some there are some uh, things uh, that hopefully this sort of thing will help overcome in terms of uh, misperceptions probably about the process and uh, you know the and again uh, the culture around injury maybe among among our singers you know and hopefully things like this will help overcome that. Well, and it's so interesting the the shame aspect because on any given day of a sport, I mean, we're in the middle of the Winter Olympics right now. If somebody injured themselves, there would be no shame that they fell on the slalom down the hill. There would be no shame around that, right? They would just have their team assembled and get to work to rehabilitate. So I find it interesting with the singing and the arts that 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 exists. Peggy, I suspect you'd like to add to this conversation well i appreciate everything that's being said i do think that um i think the exponential growth in knowledge and understanding of the voice and how it works has allowed physicians to um to to better diagnose and better understand how injuries occur and i think that knowledge has and this collaboration between the disciplines, those two things have created this new environment that we're talking about, where it shouldn't be and doesn't have to be shame-based. Part of the shame-based was based was the fact that there was a lot of ignorance about even the the makeup of the vocal folds themselves, as Al knows only very well. So with the expansion of knowledge in voice medicine and in the medicine world. We are understanding more and more how injuries occur, you know, what's what's an injury, what's a normal, um, you know, is swelling normal, is that an injury, is that something we should worry about? I mean, we have a whole different perspective about this. And I think that's being shared with the singers, shared with the teachers, and it's this interdisciplinary communication along with the expansion and knowledge that's created this whole new environment. I mean, back in the 50s, 60s, even the early 70s, vocal fold surgery, as Al can tell you, to remove a mass involves stripping the vocal folds. And so people ended up very often scarred from this surgery. So that gave vocal fold surgery a bad name. Now we have these very sophisticated methods that physicians do of removing masses, and your chances of having a good result are, are greatly increased. So it's a whole new paradigm. And I think we're all just catching up to it. Mm -hmm. I have to say, and I don't know Al, uh, how you tolerate it, but I still hear constantly in the ENT field, just locally, I'm sorry, just recently, um, you know, a singer who has nodules, they've been offered no rehabilitation with a speech therapist or a singing voice specialist, and the doctor's recommending surgery. 
And I just find that so frustrating and appalling. And, and I don't know how you contend with that all the time. I'll, I'll, give, you the, I'll give you the head exploding answer. Or I'll give you a little more mature answer. Um, <laughs> there's the head exploding answer, which is, you know, there, there are probably cases where it's just wrong, you know, plain old wrong. And that's real. I mean, that is probably not the best thing to do in, in some of those cases. Again, I don't speak with any specific knowledge. Uh, one of the things that makes this a little bit more difficult is the uh, the nomenclature, and not to get too tied up in this. You know, when we talk about vocal nodules, we are talking about one thing. When lots and lots of very wonderful, very committed people in the speech pathology world, in the singing teacher world, and definitely in the otolaryngology world, when they use the term nodule, they do not mean what you know, this sounds like the Princess Bride. They do not mean what, what we are saying, you know. Uh, so let's just make sure that, that we give people a little bit room. When we talk about nodules being something that occur, you know, bilateral vocal fold lesions, which happen in the mid membranous vocal fold, you know, probably related to overuse, which happens almost exclusively in women in their 20s and school age boys. Um, you know, that's vocal fold nodules. And they're, to me, they're not an operative problem, you know. Um, so given the fact, if we give people a little room that they're talking about operating on things, you know, that they could be talking about the wrong thing, which is its own kind of concerning because they aren't using the ideal nomenclature. Are they really up to date on how things should be done? I think that's a little bit of a question mark there. Um, but yeah, no, it, it is, it's, uh, there are, I can't, it's hard to imagine a singer getting vocal surgery who isn't engaged in a relationship th that, that includes the, the, the physician and the teacher saying, and of course, our voice therapist. I mean, who's getting that? I mean, oh, it, it happens. happens all, you know that. It ha I mean, you and I know that it happens all the time uh, because yeah. they in our care at some point afterwards. But also, you know, also there's a there's a responsibility to the singer. The singer themselves has a responsibility to to not just turn over your livelihood or your neck even if you're if you're a singer and you what you do is you sing every thursday night in your church choir you have a responsibility to yourself to be thorough with your with this decision um i i i can't imagine that there's anybody who would just go into one person and they say you have to cut those out and they say okay i but i know there are people that that do that and, and it I, is, fortunately, it is it is the exception. I mean, fortunately, but but it does happen. Yeah, it it it's it's been recommended to me uh, uh, more than once, more than twice. Mm -hmm. That when you feel a little thing, I know. Look at his little face. Uh, when you see when you see, you go in and you get looked at, and the recommendation is, I could just cut that off. It's a, it's a simple. I can hear the words. It's a simple surgery. It doesn't take anything. You just you just quiet for a couple of weeks and you'll be fine. But alarm bells go off in my head and, and I remember saying, well, is it a foreign thing or is it actually part of the vocal tissue? Like, are you actually cutting away part of my vocal tissue? Like, so it, 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 you have to know enough to ask questions. You have to know enough to be smart. You have to know well, enough there, to assemble the team that can help you. Yeah, I think that's really important. and. You know, for lots of our, I'm guessing, uh, I may be ignorant, um, for lots of people listening to this webinar, they are, they are involved in communities that where these folks are, you know, relatively accessible to them geographically. For a lot of our folks, it isn't. They just aren't as many people available around you. And that that's tough. It's hard to imagine that someone, um, it, we've got a lot of work before we get from problem to surgery, right? There's this huge, most of what we do. I mean, I operate on a very small fraction of people I see. It may be 10%. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the performing voice specialist, for the, real, for the singer, it's less than 10%, you know? So there's a lot to talk about short of surgery. But yeah, it's hard to imagine somebody's going to get an operation who hasn't had a reasonable, a reasonable set of prep. There is, there is a little vein of conversation in our field about you know, are, are we being too restrictive, too cautious? Are we putting people through too many hoops? That's not inconceivable, you know, that we over-prepare and we're over-cautious about people, uh, people getting voice voice surgery. I, I think there's a little, little bit of that, but God, every time I bend a rule, I, I don't want to say cut a corner, but every time I bend a rule or just, you know, maybe lighten up on a concern or suggestion, Man, it's like the world tells me, you know, it doesn't go as well, you know. 
You know, Peggy and I had a really interesting conversation last uh, year that I'd love to pull you in on this, Al, because you use this word. And it's around the word misuse or abuse. And, you know, there's been kind of a move uh, away from that language um, in our field a bit. But, Peggy, you, I, am, I should have asked you if it was okay, but would you mind sharing? Uh, we had a conversation where you actually said, thought that there should be some accountability to our singers. Well, what I think is that if you're on the medical side of voice care, that we have an incredible opportunity to help educate the singer. I would say, Mickey, that even though singers should know, singers don't know. We're not at the point yet where, where even high-level singers really understand their instrument. And certainly they don't understand the intricacies of of the vocal folds and what can go wrong and the nature of different bumps and so forth. So it may be a little unfair to expect that kind of understanding of such a complex instrument. But I do believe that on our side of it, and Al, you were saying earlier about um, not creating the catastrophe atmosphere. I think what we have to do, is, or what I try to do, and what we try to do is walk a fine line between where you educate the singer, you are honest with them about what's going on, you talk about it in a realistic way, but you also put it in perspective. You know, I always tell people if they come in and they're diagnosed with masses and they're having a heart attack, I always say, you know, there are people standing at the Met with something on their vocal folds. There are people all over Broadway with something on their vocal folds. It doesn't mean it has to be taken off. But, but by the same token, I also say, you know, some person comes, oh, a singer will come in, they'll have a little teeny something on their vocal folds, and ultimately it is something that has to go. Somebody else has another mass of a different size, maybe a little bigger, and it's non-symptomatic. So what we have to do, I think, is educate people. And some injuries are related to misuse or abuse. I don't think misuse or abuse are bad words, especially for young singers. I think it's important to tell them what they should and shouldn't do, where they increase their risk for injury. That's our responsibility. I think it's unethical not to tell them, but we can tell them in a way that's not condemning, but is reinforcing. Here is information to help you protect yourself. So I think we have a tremendous responsibility in that regard in the voice medicine profession. I, if I can jump in, I, I absolutely, uh, I think that's right on. I, I am not great with those words. I don't I don't know quite know when to use them. Abuse, misuse, overuse. Overuse, I think I got, but um, I've heard lots of definitions, and I I think I can tell, but but I do try to be cautious because I don't want to get that wrong. Um, but there is too much. There is too often. There is too loud. Um, I think that's important. One warning thing. Uh, one thing I've learned over the last five or ten years about our young singers, and I'm specifically talking about early career is that the difference uh, I've learned in many aspects of voice care, be it, uh, be it a power problem, right? Weak vocal cord, volume problem, meaning the volume of the vocal fold, rather than a uh, there's a growth on the vocal cord swelling, et cetera. One thing is that they manifest quite differently. You know, ultimately people manifest with hoarseness, right? What we hear in their voice. Many of them manifest with, um, you know, complaints that their, their, their singing is more effortful and, you know, but, you know, but everyone thinks I sound great, for example. One of the things that's a real warning sign is discomfort. Many, many of our young folks will come in with discomfort. They will complain of throat pain, throat ache, et cetera, et cetera. And no one thinks they sound bad. And they don't think they sound bad. But it is an absolute sign of pathology. Generally speaking, the healthier you are, the younger you are, um, they, the less likely that they will uh, automatically have hoarseness as a symptom of vocal fold pathology. They can muscle through, power through, breath support their way through many vocal pathologies without sounding bad. It's just effortful and it hurts. So watch out when you hear that sound. This is what I'm fearful about. You know, when people get scoped, right? That's what we're talking about, looking at the voice box and the scope, and they don't see anything. Uh, and the patient doesn't sound that bad, but they say it hurts, it aches, they automatically go, not not unreasonably, but probably incompletely assessed to technique. Whereas if they're, if they're evaluated more carefully and we think, ah, young person, it aches, it hurts, there's got to be a structural 
geometric or vibratory problem explaining the pathophysiology that gets them to have that discomfort because they weren't this way a month ago. You know, and I think that's an important missing piece I've learned. Younger folks, discomfort, fatigue, more of a presenting symptom than just plain old dysphonia. And you've got to explain it. You can't just say, I don't see anything. Go see your singing teacher. And, and you know what, Al? That's a perfect example of how the sophistication of voice physicians like yourself, the ability to see a paresis, to understand it now, a weakness in a vocal fold, um, and, the, and the ability to visualize that has so advanced the field that you can understand now this is a cause. No, I don't see a bump, but there are other things that create these cycles. And that's an absolute direct product of the advancements in the technology. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and it's the, getting, it, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, no, no, please, sir. Um, it, it's, it's getting the professional singer, amateur singer, uh, young student to understand that, that um, that previously where you had had doubt you could trust your physician or you could you could fall into the hands of somebody who would explain something to us that way it's getting people now to understand that because of the advancements chances are you're going to fall into the hands of a dr marati and be able to be heard you know there's nothing on my there's nothing in my neck but i it's hard and it feels it feels difficult that being said that being said, they're, they're still few and far between, you know, to fall into uh, uh, the hands of somebody like you, for instance, who, who will say, yeah, if you feel something there, then let's explore and see what that is. Also, go ahead, Peggy, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm done, go ahead. I want to hear what you say. I was just going to jump in on that and say that we, we, I swear, we see patients every week that have been misdiagnosed by people who, physicians who call themselves or who are comfortable looking at vocal folds. You see it all the time. I mean, I, we do at least, at least I think we do. So it is a problem. I mean, there aren't enough people like Al to go around who really know what they're looking at. And it's not, it's not that people mean to misdiagnose. It's just I'm a little less. Anyway, I'm going to go there my wife so she can listen to all this. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. Hi. <laughs> it's a, it's hear what it's saying. And I think what singers have to understand, what I would say to singers is, if you go to a physician and they say they don't know what the reason is, or it must be your technique, and you and your teacher feel like you're following your technique and you're trying to do things right, go someplace else. Keep looking until you find somebody. <laughs> One of the first things that Sadaloff ever taught me, Dr. Sadaloff ever said is to me was, if, if the singer says something's wrong, something's wrong. Yeah, and if we I, I believe that. that's on us, it's not on them. Especially, I, the I, I completely believe that. I mean, there was my professor of medical school, you know, if, if you listen to the patient, they will tell you what the problem is, you know. And I think there's a lot to that. Now, there are people who have technique issues, and it, often it's they're just singing the wrong stuff or the wrong register or whatever. They're, they're just doing basic wrong stuff. But it's not very often a patient will see a physician or a voice care team with this voice therapist, and then someone will go, you know, that one little thing in your passaggio, I, that's really you're bumping up against the blah, blah, blah. You know, it just doesn't happen that much, at least at my level. Um, I, think, I think there's got to be, you must start with a, an obsession to explain why it's happening and you may end up with the you know i did not see i can't explain it let's work with the with the team you know uh you can end up there but man don't start there and al wouldn't you agree that sometimes um it's a it's like a perfect storm it's more than one element i feel like i tell patients this all the time they come in they say well he said this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong I tell them that's not unusual. Any physician who's looking at you like Dr. Sadloff does and finding every speck of dust, you know, he's going to see everything that's going on. The question for us is always what's actually creating the symptom? Yeah. Is it one? Is it one? Is it reflux? Is it paresis? Is it a little swelling? Or is it that perfect storm that they've all three occurred at one time and are tipping the ship? I mean, and, and when we educate patients that way, yeah, I think it's very helpful. But again, the patients have got to get to the right person to be yeah. educated.
And I mean, I live in a city where we have, I think, seven laryngologists here now. Al. Nine, 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 and they're super people. Not just, and then we have some, you know, in ENT voice specialists, and and even here, I mean, I've had, I've been contacted just in the last month by probably ten injured singers, some of with some pretty not great diagnoses that I have to then get into Al's office. Um, to get the right diagnosis before anything can happen. Um, it uh, does beg the question, and I don't mean to derail this, you know, go ahead. where did all these people come from? The injured singers? Yes. Well, it, I mean, <laughs> that begs the question that it infuriates me as well. I mean, but again, it's always, as you taught me, multifactorial, right? It's not, there may be a singing technique issue as a component, but most likely there are other underlying components such as reflux or allergies or other things. And it's a high risk activity. Mm -hmm. You know, you're pushing the envelope if you're singing on a regular basis. The only other thing I want to say about physicians is just if we're speaking to singers in general on this a cat on this um, discussion is that one thing that's very confusing for professional singers is they can you can go to two or three top docs in the country and you can get two or three maybe varying diagnosis or varying suggestions of treatment and for singers who have the money to do that high level singers that can be very very confusing mm -hmm. and I don't know what the answer to that is usually I tell people just go where you you're gonna have to go where you feel most comfortable but you can have three excellent, highly regarded voice docs with three different ideas about how something should be treated. Mm -hmm. and it can get complicated because it is a, it's not always so simple. That's right. And it sometimes takes time with the medical team, with the doctor at the helm of that, it can take time to figure out what's going on and where the care needs to start. Um, I find that often. I want to um, remind our uh, attendees, we please, we welcome your questions and you can just, there's a little question box that you can type in and, and I will ask the question on your behalf. We do have, uh, Brian Joyce has typed in and said, I am an opera singer and now an SLP. I am finding that ENTs miss referring to SLPs, especially since many SLPs do not like working with voice therapy. So we haven't, I didn't have an SLP on our panel tonight. Um, but he brings up an interesting point, doesn't wow. he? Yeah, that's a, that's a for real thing. You know, there are, uh, you know, a huge population of wonderful committed people who have dedicated their life to speech language pathology, you know, many of them in, in uh, schools and in uh, like in a head and neck cancer population or dysphagia, swallowing problems, uh, nursing homes, uh, inpatient, you know, taking care of people in the hospital. And there is a very small committed sliver, and I, I don't know the number, but it's a very teeny percentage who have focused their professional lives around uh, singing uh, voice in general, and then singing voice in particular. That is correct. They are they are harder to find, and often the speech pathologist will will be the resource in their area. And whether or not that person is, meaning if someone isn't otherwise identified as sort of in that that niche. They, uh, an experienced person in the region may get referred to patient and he or she may not be that comfortable or, or that experienced in dealing with that problem. That is a, that is an absolute local issue. We, we see that here. We have terrific speech pathologists in the area, but outside of our own, you know, awesome team. And they are awesome, by the way. Um, you know, it, it, we, we say, well, aha, you know, this person's really good at this in Spokane. This person's really good at this in Aberdeen, this, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It is, that's, that's a real thing. And I don't know where those people are going to come from. Talking to some of speech, talking to some of the leaders in speech language pathology, I think there is a movement afoot. Um, and I hope I'm not speaking, but I sense that there's movement afoot to, to refocus some of the training and uh, workforce initiatives to help, uh, to, to deal with this, um, I don't want to say missing population or this workforce issue, but I think that's real. People get it. I, I sense that it's being attended to because of this concern. It is actually. ASHA, the Professional Organization for Speech Language Pathologists, just this past year are designating special uh, recognition for speech paths who are trained in voice. 
So yeah. it's a hot topic. It's coming along. And um, and I would also say that in the last 15 years in Dr. Sadloff's office, every resume we've gotten for a new position for a speech pathologist has been a singer who's gone back to school for the most part and who's been out singing, teaching, gone back to school, gotten a speech path degree, and now is able to do double duty as a speech path and a singing voice specialist. So I think there are more and more people going into this field. I get calls every week about this, about singers wanting to do this. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a hot area for sure. I and agree. I, 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 I do think the, 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 the gentleman, I believe gentleman wrote in the note, I, I think that is a national concern. I, I, sh I share that person's concern. Yeah. Well, and I think that this hybrid profession really is the way. And in fact, Ken Bozeman types in, in my experience, the best SLPs for treating singers started out as singers, often with voice degrees before going into SLP training. I love it when a performance major goes on into SLP training. And I think that hybrid uh, profession really is the direction of the future for some of those. I think so, too. I have a question for Mickey. Um, Mickey... Mm -hmm. Among your level of elite singers, do people tend to talk about to one another their vocal problems or only to their most intimate friends? The only person that has ever, ever discussed this with me is Natalie Desai. Mm -hmm. And she's, she's <laughs> the only one. And, she's, and right. she's not the only one I've ever sung with that has either been um, injured, mm -hmm recovering from an injury uh, certainly it's uh no people they don't talk about it singers don't talk about it as as common as it is and as i don't think i've ever sung an opera at one point not having a, a fellow singer say to me i sang too hard you know i'm, I'm gonna be hoarse tomorrow you know or you know just any kind of vocal um uh, I don't think I've ever, uh, more often than not, I'm singing in a cast with singers who are singing on steroids. Like I don't, it happens so, so much. It's, it's, uh, it's shocking. However. Can, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. However, what? However, it, it's, it's impossible. It's impossible to, you know, right now Parsifal is happening at the Met. It's six hours long. And uh, you're singing in a 4,000 seat house with an orchestra that's 100 people in the orchestra pit and it's six hours long. It's not difficult math to do, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Natalie Desai was very open about it and she, because she was really advocate, was an advocate for, for getting support. Mm -hmm. That we all go through it, we all have struggles, we all need a team. And, 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 and to, to that extent, for the community, you know, it's coming back to something you were talking about, Peggy, um, for the singer who sings in a community chorus, mm -hmm. church, you know, your safe circle is going to be smaller than mine. Your safe team, your support circle is going to be smaller than mine. Mine's going to include the three of you and 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 a teacher and a couple of coaches. Theirs might be a, a trusted teacher and friend. They're they're, you know, somebody who can call Dr. Reagan and say, you know, I need you to see this person which I have done on a number of occasions. That, that circle's gonna be smaller. There does need to be a circle, however. I really believe that it's impossible. We go and get an annual physical every year. How many professional singers go in and have their neck looked at every six to eight months, even every 12 months? How many of us will go in and say, it's time for a checkup. Look inside my neck and tell me what you see. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I would say the percentage is probably close to zero. Right. Would you say that Sorry, say again, Peggy, I didn't hear you. Would you say that the big fear factor among singers, elite singers, and, and when you once you get to that little top of the triangle, the whole field is so competitive. It's so difficult. There's so few people who actually make a career. Do you think part of that reticence is based in just fear for your reputation? Yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely do. Yeah, I think you, if you, if they find out you've been to the doctor because you had an injury, um, there's not a lot of opera houses that are going to trust you with a nine or ten million dollar production. Um, so, so there's partly that. There's partly that a lack of of information 
I'm sorry. There's lack just of, a lack of, of information among singers. Right. A lack of information among singers. Not you know, the, the number right. of singers who gargle and steam away F things it is astonishing. <laughs> yeah. Not not to sound all ivory tower uh -huh. here from the, from the university, but um, you know I'm interested. Circling back to Kari's initial example she gave about the difference between the performing singer and the performing athlete, and how we uh, societally even and even within our profession how we how we sense, interpret, or categorize their injuries. You know, um, this sense of non uh, concern about disclosure. Uh, vulnerability, business decisions that go along with being an injured singer. You know, I got to think some of it's similar to some of the sports stuff, right? I mean, people are under different contracts, uh, not just the number of zeros, but the, the structure of the contracts. You know, but I wonder if um, there's something that can be learned from that community. That's a highly business, um, you know, the, the, the business world has has studied and tried to, you know, figure out this that, that community, that business. And I wonder from a scholarly standpoint, if there's something we could do, right, us can figure out what is the actual number? How do people actually talk about it? Are we just missing the breakthrough study that says, you know, this really happens 40% of your singers, dear Mr. Opera Manager or Miss Opera Manager, 40% of your singers are on steroids at any point. Did you actually know that? I know we talk about it, we think it, but do we actually know it? What can we do? What can we do to have a different conversation 10 years from now, other than wait around for the doctors to get better looking at vocal cords, really. It's That's not just us. Yeah, it's, you know, the one thing I would say, Al, is that we, we, we all use the analogy now of singers as um, professional vocal athletes, because we want to draw that correlation between sports and singing. Everybody, both groups are pushing the envelope with the physical body. And we all know that there are limits. There's, everybody's voice is finite. There's a, there's a, place beyond which you cannot go without experiencing some sort of breakdown in the instrument. It's true for singers, it's true for athletes, but but it's pushing that envelope. But the but that and so that's a good um, equation or equating, but the a central problem is that in sports, there's so much money invested in sports that when a sports figure gets hurt, their multi-million dollar contract continues through that year, even if they don't play for that year. A singer gets hurt, they're not making much money anyway, even a high level singer, and they're out. They're done and there's no money and it impugns their reputation. And because contracts are often done a year, it puts that in jeopardy. So this, I just wanted to interject that the correlation for physical stress is correct, but the whole financial structure is so yeah, different. No, the, the nature of the contracts are quite different and uh, I, I agree with you. It's a problem. I mean, we, we have a, uh, some questions. Oh, uh, by the way, Peggy, Shannon Coates says, so true, Peggy. <laughs> um, we have a, from Crystal Lau, she says, uh, she's a graduate student in vocal performance and she'd like to know why the topic of vocal health is not specifically isolated as an academic discussion. And I'll respond briefly to that. In my academic class of voice pedagogy, it absolutely is a, a huge topic of conversation for obvious reasons. And we, in fact, go visit Dr. Marathi's clinic and hang out with him for a couple hours. And so, and I think you're seeing that more and more. I think the bigger uh, aspect too is that it's not only academics. We have a, our field of voice is also the private sector of voice teaching. There are people that never go to college to either teach voice or study voice, and especially as CCM has become a bigger field. And so we have to keep broadening our reach to people that it doesn't remain in this field of academics, that it, it extends outside of that. But I don't know if you guys have a response to that. She wants to know why vocal health is not isolated. It's slowly. I would say look at the Nats Journal. Look at it 15 years ago, the articles in the Nats Journal, and look at the articles in the Nats Journal now. Mm -hmm. look, at, look at the increase in voice medicine articles, voice science articles. I mean, it's changing. <laughs> Things are changing. They just never change fast enough. That's well, all. It's trickling down. I mean, there's been such a, a, this is a hot topic for me right now as I'm working on a, a current paper. Uh, for the Bernard Symposium where, you know, um, how do we 
continue to include people that feel on the outside of what is perceived to be an academic nature of our profession, the studying of the mechanics of the singing voice and vocal health. And so I think we just have to keep broadening. How do we get articles from all of us in mainstream where people are teaching voice and studying voice? Well, ironically, you're, I, I, I'm no deep genius on, on this topic, but I, from what I do know, ironically, you're probably, the, the area where the most yardage can come is probably exactly from the community collaboration with our community singers and the teachers of singing, right? They've got the numbers, the volume, the people, uh, and in, and there's obviously plenty of smarts, plenty of plenty of experience. It's a matter of getting folks together because whether or not the 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 the, the people are lining up the vocal cords and the mechanics and the Fourier transformations and all the stuff that you know I personally don't understand. Um, you know, whether they're doing that, that's probably going to go on outside of the community. But the things that need to happen about understanding, even the thing we talked about with Mickey, you know, how often is this really happening? How big of a problem is it? What are people doing? What are our attitudes toward it? I mean, that's where this webinar in 10 years is different. Maybe someone's going to come along and say, you know what, turns out the vocal cord really operates on peanut butter, or there's something about it that's going to happen. There may be a little Nobel Prize action coming, but I guarantee you the thing that's going to make this conversation different isn't a vocal cord breakthrough in 10 years. It's a community breakthrough and understanding what the heck we do. How do we talk about it? That's what's happening in laryngology. It's not just looking at the vocal cords. That's happening. The technology is getting better, right? There's going to be a stroboscopy unit in every box of cereal pretty soon. But... What matters is that people are obsessed with understanding vocal function and they talk about it. We compare notes. We're texting each other securely uh, pictures of, uh, you know, un under, uh, you know, all HIPAA compliant, actually. Uh, you know, like, what, do you, what do you think of this? You know, I was just writing this thing, um, you know, this uh, column I'm writing for ANT Ideology News in the UK, you know, that when I started 20 years ago, I finished fellowship nearly 20 years ago. I mean, if I didn't know what I was doing with the case, which was not uncommon, you know, I would find a VHS tape and get it and and write out this letter and ship it off, you know, uh, to some brilliant world class laryngologist who may or may not decide they would grace me. And they often did with the time of looking, you know, finding a VHS player to pop it in and look at my grainy, crappy tape to then, then give me a call or a letter back of what the heck I think is going on. Now, we just... People send like these high quality videos to each other in a minute. Now that's the kind of conversation I think that has mattered to voice care. It's not just a technology in the clinic, it's technology outside a clinic and this sense of community. And I'm sure it's happening with things like Nats, but I think my sense is that's where this webinar will be different. The 2028 20, version of this webinar is gonna be about your community. It's gonna be about how we talk, how we decatastrophize and how we have understood exactly what's going on and uh, started to make a difference. Well, I completely and totally, so, I'm sorry, Corey. I was, I was just gonna say we have a date in 2028, the four of us, to hold this <laughs> webinar again, the encore version. Go ahead. Yeah, Nick. I'm gonna be on a farm somewhere, so find <laughs> me. Um, <laughs> it, it, but I completely agree with, with what Al just said. And, and speaking to the singers, I, I uh, if you don't know how to take care of yourself and your vocal health, get online, find a name, write an email, make a phone call, send it. Because if, if as I have found, much of the community in your end of the spectrum is so willing to talk to us and so willing to, to you know, Kari, I send you people all the time and you respond and you take time and you give them information. There's so there's a willing collaboration there. If you're not getting a class uh, and being taught how to how to, to to do your own vocal health and the things you should be doing for yourself, get online, send an email, send a text, make a phone call and someone will gladly respond. I, I'm absolutely positive of that. I, I agree with you. I also think that it, it's really now with all that we know and all the information we have, it is inexcusable and almost unethical for schools to offer performance degrees and let kids come in at 18 as a vocal performance major and not require them to take a vocal health class and a simple vocal anatomy physiology class. I mean, I don't mean to stand in judgment of schools. It's very hard. It's money. It's time consuming. 
but now there's no excuse for it. Absolutely. And that, there's yeah. nobody who understands their instrument less than singers in the instrumental world and in the musical world. And this, it should happen. It should we happen. Have to set that standard. We absolutely have to set that standard. And, and short of uh, our profession setting uh, credentialing certifications, right? We have to instead hold ourselves accountable, the profession of voice teaching and knowledge, including vocal health. Well, that, but I'm talking about holding academia responsible. You know, schools are now big business. I mean, that's just a fact. And part of that big business with performance majors, voice performance majors, should be required vocal health and anatomy the first year or two they're in school. Does mm -hmm. Nats have a policy or a stance on that? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. This is just my opinion right now. Well, it seems like that'd be a reasonable discussion to move forward. I think you will. Uh, we've got a couple great questions here. Um, actually, we have a lot of state. Let, let's go to the to Brian Joyce says. Uh, when does the panel think a patient should be referred to speech therapy, or back to voice teacher, or refer both to work as a team? Al, when do you do that? For treatment, yeah, that's an excellent question. And I, I if I, if I. I get the sense of the question. I hope I'm right. I get the sense of the question. I think we're trying to get out. What is there a gray area? When is it duplicative? When is it redundant? Um, you know, we all go to great lengths all the time to say, well, this is what this person does and this is what that person does. But uh, the secret is there is some overlap, ladies and gentlemen. There really is. Uh, different perspectives, talking about sim similar things. There's, there's definitely a little bit of supportive, uh, you know, um, supportive uh, uh, reinforcement there. I, I can't speak that specifically about it. I would say that it is the rare, it is the rare patient in my voice clinic that ha will have, it will come in horse, will have a problem, and I don't think they need to see a voice therapist at all. I'm, you know, the, the, that it, that unless I gave that kind of Kind of cartoonish example. Somebody's just singing the wrong stuff. You know, they've they've they came in with their mind made up, or the or the the the, the singing teacher got to them pretty early, and they say something's not quite right. You know, but usually the the singing teacher knows they're singing the wrong stuff, right? I and mean, this is what they do, but rarely do they not need to see a voice therapist. So I, I in my world, I don't know how common that is when they're dealing with a vocal performance issue, and it is specifically with something doing with singing then there's an overlap. And I would say there are patients who have specific medical or maladaptive things that I, I sense, and please correct me, I sense that the, the singing teacher wants to see a little bit of work on that from a more medical combination standpoint with a therapist before they go, in, they go, they go off into refocusing in the, in the singing uh, technique. And the dirty truth is some of it has to do with money. Uh, because they they uh, not in a bad way it, for, to be protective of their client because they don't want to be doing the the cash based you know singing lessons when they often not always but often have insurance covered medical and speech pathology issues is is that wildly wrong or do you think that's reasonable? I'm not sure personally. I'm not sure. I, I would say in in one point that you made that I think a lot of teachers. When they have a student that goes to see a physician about a voice problem that the teacher is aware of, the t some teachers really welcome the therapy because they know that they're not able. That they, they've reached a point where they haven't been able to fix whatever's going on with the singer, and they want it fixed before they get the singer back. And as long as the therapist, singing voice specialist or speech therapist, is clear that they're not trying to be the teacher but get them back to the teacher. I find that teachers are very willing and eager to have the work done and not to take the responsibility for something they cannot do. But th yeah, that's- no, I, I, I totally agree with that. I think that was a, more the second half of what I said. Yeah, I agree. Exactly. Um, in our office, <laughs> our cell office is very authoritative about this and strict. I mean, everybody that comes in with a voice problem, whether they're a professional or not, they're going to get speech therapy and they're going to get singing voice work, period. And almost every patient does it. I mean, he he holds that line. He won't do surgery without it. He won't consider anything without it. He, he absolutely demands that they have this, have 
some amount of speech therapy and or singing work. I think we always have to be mindful of, of the communities that don't have this kind of uh, clinic right. that the you're whole, describing. The whole other problem. Right, right. We, um, we have a, a great question from Kelly Ellenwood. She says, since, since we have all you fine folks here, let's hear your top three vocal health guidelines. That's actually a, a really lovely uh, segue as we are nearing the end of our time together. Al, would you like to start? Well, I mean, you know, from the Bureau of uh, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, I would say <laughs> avoid alcohol, tobacco, and caffeine. Uh, you know, those are pretty easy. Um, you know, pe people are, um, uh, I'll, I'll count that as one. And the second one would be uh, most singers, when they find themselves in an overuse situation, um, it's usually their talking that's a big problem. Uh, you know, they're, they're, it's not always their hours on stage, it's their time off stage. Just be, be mindful of that. Uh, I think those are two good things I would start. They're pretty basic. Those are good. Mickey, how about from the singing perspective? Uh, it, the the, the same thing, when we change climates and we're on the airplane and on and off the airplane and it's dry and not dry, you have to be the same. You have to be really careful of how much you're drinking. You have to be really careful of things like um, eating too late at night because reflux can be an issue you know that that and and you know, oftentimes you won't realize reflux is an issue until you wake up the next morning <laughs> so i think i have to be careful of that i have to be careful of um when i'm on a job and 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 it's a particularly strenuous role um going out at night after a performance as, as fun as it is and as much as i love it you know i, I can't go sit in a bar and oftentimes it's the thing that's just going to kill me is, is, you know, going out and sitting with colleagues and having a couple of drinks and you talk after the performance and, and mm -hmm. um, you're pretty tired. You have to kind of treat yourself a little bit carefully that you can, you can wing it when you're in rehearsals. The other thing I really have to do is that I need a certain amount of humidity in the air. I have to be, it, and when you're singing dry climates like Santa Fe and, and, um, I, I'm always really happy for a good solid rain that happens. The humidity does help, it makes everything feel just a little bit more rested. Nikki, can I ask you a question? Yes, ma'am. Do you think sleep is an important factor for you? Yeah, but really specific hours. Sleep before midnight makes a big difference, I gotta Ooh. say. Sleep yeah. before midnight makes a big difference. Um, um, and uh, and to, to which is really difficult the night of a performance because we're all wired for sound and until you know you really just kind of collapse but yeah i do and again i also think things like making sure you're getting enough exercise because then you can sleep at night you know it's it's just the whole treat yourself like you're you're an endurance um you're running a long race which which we are you know peggy from the voice uh, teacher voice clinic what would your, do you have? Well, the standard rules that we've all talked about, hydration, not eating late, all of those things, less loud. But what I love is an analogy that everybody's using now. I tell people, just realize that every day you got $50 worth of voice. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to spend it? Once mm -hmm. you spend it, it's gone. And you're singing, you're talking, you're singing on your capital and not your interest. But if you figure you get 50 bucks worth of voice a day, think about how you're going to use it. The louder you are, the more voice you're going to use up. The more you use it, the more you use it. It's a, it's not infinite. It is finite. And if a singer thinks about that every day, I think it puts perspective at least on use. And that's a great analogy. Lots of people are using that. And I think sleep is underrated. The reason I asked Mickey that question is just in medicine in general, there, there's more and more a uh, study of sleep and the impact on the body. And because of the way we live now and the way you travel, Mickey, and the way, mm -hmm. you know, the way we are, the way we don't sleep, I think that sleep or the kind of sleep we get or the lack of sleep um, could be a huge factor in many elements of what impacts us as singers. Mm -hmm. can, can I throw one other th thing out there? And, and it, it may be a big can of worms that we don't have time to deal with. Um, the mental health aspects of mm -hmm. doing this, 
um, you, you know, it, it, it's, it, it can take its toll on you and you can use other things to make yourself uh, feel more comfortable, but it's really important to have a support staff, or not staff, a support group, a, a safe circle. It's not just for your vocal health, it's for your mental health as well. It's, it's, it, nobody can do um, what we do either in a community level or a, a, a professional level, elite level, 18, 18 years old and you're living in a different city for the first time. It's important, your mental health is a really important part of, of, this, um, of this art form. You know, find yourself a community, get yourself into a, a group, don't spend too much time isolated. You know, that, that's a huge aspect of the things I need to do when I travel and when I sing. That's a that's great. Excellent. Excellent point. Excellent segue too to the uh, you know to some of the local the community building projects that Kari, is, Kari and I have worked on and things like that. I know Peggy and uh, so I think that's a that's a great point. And it's all about the mind body connection, and that's being talked about so much now, more and more in voice, and it's been in the athletic world for a while now. Mm -hmm. so it's a great it's a great subject. Mm. Well. Um, Mickey, uh, someone would like to know how many minutes or hours do you sing per day when performing? When I'm performing, I just did um, um, Electra, and it's an hour and 45 minutes long, and I sang 18 minutes of it. But when I do something, um, there was a project I did before that that was three hours long, and I sang collectively about two hours and 40 minutes of it. On a day like that, I don't say a whole lot to anybody. But yeah. I have two kids, so <laughs> you know, I, I'm I'm shuffling people all around, and you know it's not unusual at all for me to drop somebody off at karate and then go to the theater. You know, I I don't sing um, at this point. I, it's easier for me to talk about when I was a student. There was a lot more study that happened be, around around singing, and not so much using my neck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I would I would study the music and not sing through it. I would I would learn the language. I would study the text. I would, and I'd probably spend maybe forty five minutes to an hour a day, mm -hmm. working on stuff. The rest of it is so much you can do where you don't have to sing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't use it if you don't have to. Well, as we're um, I as we're getting now just with a couple minutes left, I want to just first of all take a moment and thank my esteemed panel. Thank you all for being here and to thank uh, Inside View Press and the Voice Foundation for sponsoring this chat. And there's three conferences I want to briefly mention that in, involve this multidisciplinary aspect that we've talked about tonight. Al, would you like to briefly promote the Fall Voice? Do you have yeah, your thank you. We we do. Oh, oh, wait. What did I? What did I? What did oh, I have right here? Oh, what do you no. have here? You have that. Oh, that's I just found it. <gasps> so found surprising. It. So yeah. Uh, so Fall Voice Seattle, uh, October twenty-five through twenty-seven. Fallvoice.org. It's uh, pretty spectacular. And um, also, um, Al Maradi and myself and our colleague Marty Nevdal are the head of the Northwest Voice Conference, Art and Science of the Performing Voice, which is in Seattle, April 13th and 14th. And this is our third year. And we have First some- First year had Mickey Martins and it was awesome. It was awesome. People still talk about both her recital and her master class. It was a highlight. And this year, Joan Later will be our, our singing a uh, person that will come and give a master class and present on a, a Belcher's toolbox and right. the other Al are the other people coming. Uh, yeah, so Blake Simpson from UT San Antonio, uh, world famous laryngologist, and the one and only Edie Happner from USC from the speech pathology world. So we have quite a lineup, and that's in gosh, that's in two months in Seattle, April thirteenth of April. And then finally, the Voice Foundation Symposium, May thirtieth to June third, right in Philadelphia. So there, it's wonderful, all the information and conferences going on to expand uh, our, our knowledge across multi-disciplines. Um, it's just pretty remarkable to be in this field right now. Thank you, uh, people. Thank you, Kari. Yeah, thank, thank you, everybody. You, yes, Kari. thank you, chatters. And, um, oh, one last thing. I know Al has to go. Happy birthday, Al. Thank you. Everyone else. Join us March 11th for Teaching Very Young Singers with Shannon Coates from the University of Toronto. So good night, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. 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 Take care. Thank you.